past, present and future covers pretty much everything, I suppose. Um, Scottish seagrass. Perhaps it's a surprise, maybe not to people in this room, but that we have seagrass in Scotland. I think the traditional view is perhaps that uh, seagrass is something exotic that is associated with sort of uh, palm clad tropical islands and coral reefs and that sort of thing, which certainly has its seagrass associated with it. But we have seagrass here as well, and it is of no less importance. Um, I should just briefly mention that the uh, degree that I'm director of marine biology at Harriet Watt is this year 50 years old and is the joint oldest marine biology programme in the UK uh, alongside Bangor and Liverpool. So quite a momentous year. OK, seagrass itself. What is seagrass? It goes under a variety of different common names, but we'll stick with seagrass for now because it more or less says what it does. These are unique plants. They are the only flowering plants, higher plants if you want to call them that, um, which are able to live submerged entirely in seawater for their entire life cycle. Now, many of the ones we're going to look at tonight don't necessarily do that all the time, but many globally do so. So that makes them slightly unusual and they have challenges which other plants perhaps don't have. Equally, they have advantages that other plants perhaps don't have as well. And we might come back to that later on too. They are almost ubiquitous globally. The seas, of course, cover around 70% of the Earth's surface. Uh, most of that is not accessible to rooted plants, which require light because they need shallow uh, ground in which to establish themselves. But there are meadows worldwide from Greenland in the north and Iceland all the way to New Zealand in the south. There are three main families involved. The Cymodrosaceae, which includes Posidonaceae, and Posidonia is something we'll mention a little bit later on. Rupiaceae, which do have representatives in the UK. Rupias, there's at least two species in Scotland, but we're not going to concentrate too much on those. They tend to be more freshwater aligned, sort of very, very low salinity lagoons. They're particularly typical of uh, brackish water lagoons in, for example, Shetland and the Western Isles uh, in our locality here. The Hydrocharistidae and the one which were most concerned with tonight, the Zosteraceae, which are the most abundant seagrasses in the northern hemisphere and certainly in the northeast Atlantic area where we are at the moment. There has been a lot of concern over seagrass in the recent past. There have been estimates of global decline alongside various other marine habitats, coral reefs, mangroves and so on, salt marshes, um, of estimates up to 7% per annum. It has to be said that if there was a 7% decline per annum from the year when that was posited, then we'd be very, very low in seagrass by now, because that was, I think, about 15 to 20 years ago. So compounding 7%, you get down to something very little. Nevertheless, there are serious concerns globally for seagrasses. We can see the distribution here in pink, more or less, of the sort of uh, tropical areas temperate areas here and the black dots are the seagrasses. So we can see them extending even in Alaska up into the sort of polar Arctic sort of areas here. So they're important not just because they're under threat and are declining, they are very important as primary producers. Now, of course, as I've said, they only survive in relatively shallow coastal waters, usually on average down to about five metres below sea surface, which of course varies with tidal height and so on. And that therefore there's an, an important component of water clarity, which determines how deep the seagrasses can maintain themselves. But as primary producers, they are very important and they provide an autochthonous supply of detrital material for inshore marine systems where they occur. They're also considered to be extremely important for their associated species. They are termed in the buzzword parlance biodiversity hotspots. So they attract a lot of other things which rely on the seagrass for shelter, for food, for um, reproductive purposes, attachment of eggs and this sort of thing. Um, so they have a, a high associated diversity, which is, of course, also important. As we are aware, we're in the middle of a biodiversity crisis. So things which are good for biodiversity should be things that we're interested in. Because they've got roots, unlike other marine plants such as macroalgae, for example, they 
can contribute to sediment stabilization because they occur generally on soft sedimentary shores, sandy or muddy shores to you and me, um, as opposed to rocks. Some seagrasses grow on rocks, but very few. So most of them are in muddy sandy areas and they bind the sediment together because they've got root and rhizome systems. And that can be important in terms of stabilization of what might otherwise be quite um, dynamic shorelines. So there's a coastal protection element to seagrasses potentially. They can trap sediment so they can improve water clarity and they can accumulate sediment. So there's sediment dynamics going on there. They are associated with what is termed blue carbon. Who's heard of blue carbon before? One or two. Yes, RJ, we know you've heard of blue carbon. Um, what's blue carbon? Blue carbon is the term contribute or, or uh, applied to carbon stores in the marine environment, as opposed to green carbon, which includes things like, for example, tree trunks in forests on land, where carbon is locked up for a substantial length of time. So it is suggested that seagrass might be a contributor to blue carbon, to carbon storage. So again, in relation to the climate emergency, carbon in the atmosphere and so on, perhaps seagrass is part of the solution there. We'll come back to that later as well. Because seagrass is so as it shows in the picture, grassy stuff, which can be up to metre, metre and a half long, sometimes even bigger than that, and it's going to wave around in the water, it can attenuate wave energy. It's in shallow water, waves tend to dissipate their energy in shallow water, so this wavy battle-like stuff in the shallows can help to attenuate that wave energy and again reduce potential for coastal erosion. So Coastal engineers are quite interested in seagrass in terms of the fact that it stabilizes sediment, perhaps preventing erosion, that it attenuates wave energy, potentially, again, helping with erosion. So we'll come back to what are termed nature-based solutions again towards the end briefly. So there's a coastal protection element to all of this. They might also be, to some extent, what we might term an environmental canary. Are they an important species which is sensitive to environmental perturbations, such as inevitably climate change? They're going to be sensitive to changes in light, so things like turbidity, water clarity and so on, which will affect their ability to grow, to survive and to occur in particular areas. So we might expect them to be an, an indicator in that sense. They may show some sensitivity to nutrients, although the jury is to some extent out on that at the moment. But again, one of the concerns these days in coastal waters is diffuse pollution from nutrients coming from land, particularly things like nitrates and phosphates, plant growth nutrients. So we might expect these as plants to be sensitive to those. Um, and sediment dynamics in terms of movements of sediment or increased sediment loading from things like rainwater runoff or stormwater overflows or whatever it happens to be. So we might think, OK, they could also be useful in that regard. They are specifically an ecological quality element for the Water Framework Directive, which is an EU directive, which the UK effectively is still applying the principles of. And so it's considered to be an important element of ecological quality monitoring. Uh, and as I say, although it's an EU directive, which in theory we're not part of anymore, it's as good a tool as we've got. Nobody's got the time to reinvent it. So the agencies are still using the same principles uh, as we stand at the moment. How do we monitor that ecological quality? We can do so by thinking about the number of species of seagrass. As we'll see in the UK, that's a bit limited. So that doesn't tell us terribly much. Diversity indices of seagrass are not going to be very helpful. We might look at extent, and that's what we've tended to do quite a lot, that is indicated here, these black blotches on the coast here. This is along in the Forth near to Bowness, Bowness Sewage Works at Carradon, um, and this represents uh, the area occupied by seagrass. It is not a continuous lawn, one should emphasize. The other thing we might look at is density, shoots or leaves per meter squared, seems reasonable, but in practice there are complications there, which we'll come back to a little bit later on. So, in a Scottish context, what seagrass do we have in Scotland? This is the NBN Atlas data taken a few days ago. So we have a generic Zostera species map, which basically shows everything we've got. The darker circles are those which are accepted records that have been verified, and the paler ones, not very distinct, are ones which have not yet been properly verified, or they might be old records where the taxonomy is uncertain or something of that sort. Um, but we can see there's a fairly good spread around most of the Scottish coast. There are some places which are, have notable absences, 
perhaps because of lack of suitable habitat. But generally speaking, there's seagrass in quite a lot of places, perhaps surprisingly to most people. So we have quite an important uh, role to play. If we look at specific species, we have three, which we will come to in a moment. The most prominent of these is Sostra marina, um, which is the large eelgrass or the common eelgrass, which grows up to about a metre and a half in length and leaves are about a centimetre across or a little bit more. And we can see that these two maps pretty much are the same thing. So Zostra marina is relatively widespread, with an exception I will come to down here, where we've got Zostra marina located down here. Um, there is a bit of a controversy, and I will come back to that in a moment. So what are the other species we have? We have another one, which is much smaller, and we'll see some pictures in a moment. Zostra nolthii, the dwarf eel grass, which is effectively intertidal. So I should have said Zostra marina, largely speaking, is subtidal. It occurs below the low water tide mark or right on the edge of low water spring tides. And um, so it might be exposed at very low water, but not very often. Um, Zostra nolthii is almost exclusively intertidal. It occurs between the tides, so it's accessible when the tide goes out on the shore. Accessible in a sense that you can potentially get to it, but it tends to grow in places which are very muddy. So you probably wouldn't necessarily want to go there unless you absolutely had to. And then we have this other one over here. The map's a different colour because I've had to draw it from a different source. And Zostra angustifolia, um, which is effectively considered quite generally as a subtype or an ecotype of Zostra marina. But this is in effect intertidal. So it's a sort of intertidal form. I tend to use Zostra angustifolia as, if you like, a shorthand to save me constantly saying Zostra marina, ecad or form or uh, variety angustifolia. Um, but I've also got a sneaky suspicion that it might just about be a good species because it seems to do something rather different to the subtitle Zostra marina, and it certainly looks substantially different. Um, and its distribution is not dissimilar to that of Zostra nolti. Not surprisingly, it's also intertidal, but it has tended to be recorded largely from the East Coast. If we remember back to this map here, that is potentially because we don't have much subtitle Zostra on the East Coast. And these records here are ones which have been made of intertidal Zostra marina, which are effectively what we would also call Zostra angustifolia. So we have a little bit of a taxonomic um, issue, which is ongoing. But uh, we don't need to worry too much about that. But as I say, I'll tend to refer to angustifolia, partly because if we keep those names separate, we can unpick what's going on in terms of intertidal and subtidal. If we lump everything together as Zostra marina, it becomes more difficult to unpick what's going on if the records are not very explicit about what's being recorded. So here are some pictures of our Scottish seagrass species. I should say RBGE has played a big role in what I understand about seagrass through its herbarium. And I will say, sing the praises of the herbarium in a moment. But this is a specimen from your herbarium here of Zostra marina, Sensu Strictu, the um, subtitle version, which is effectively quite large. It's the full scat page, so you can see that this is somewhere around about a foot and a half long, quite wide leaves of about four or five per shoot. Um, and you've got a substantial rhizoid root system here. This is in the force, not too far away from where we are. This is at Bowness. And we can see a mixed bed here of the dwarf eel grass, which you can barely make out with this sort of green coloration here. And then a patch of the intertidal Zostra angustifolia, which is much larger and has much more prominent stems and branching and so on. And this is another example of angustifolia here. And this is Zostra nolthii. So you can see the difference in size. Pencil, 16 centimetres long and about half a centimetre wide. This is also typical of Zostra angustifolia living alongside uh, a sort of wet channel in the mudflat here. So that's very typical that they tend to be sort of in wetter areas on the on the mudflats. And this is a, a picture of intertidal Zostra angustifolia or Zostra marina, if you wish, um, showing it is much more branched and extensive in its growth form than the typical subtidal Zostra marina. And this is a, a subtidal bed. You can see very, very profuse growth and very long. Fantastic stuff to dive through and see what's actually in there. We've done some dive surveys on the West Coast for Zostra Marina in places like Sound of Harris, for example. 
Is seagrass a recent thing on the agenda in Scotland? Well, no, not really. Although I suppose it was been understudied for quite a long time. Um, Gleater in 1993 did a report for what was then Scottish Natural Heritage, it is now Nature Scott. 30 years ago, he identified priorities which were increased awareness. Well, hopefully I'm beginning to do that now, but 30 years a bit late down the line, perhaps. So hopefully we can increase the awareness of seagrass. Taxonomy, we're still arguing about how many species we've got. Hmm, OK, distribution surveys. Well, that's what I started about 10 years ago because we didn't really know where things were. So we are making progress on that and things are much, much better than they were even uh, 10 years ago. Uh, but again, there was a bit of a lag from 30 years ago when all of this stuff was flagged up, but the resources were not really there. Why would seagrass be important? Nobody was too worried about carbon stores in the ocean at that point. People weren't even that worried about biodiversity in 1993. It had only really just been coined at that point at the Rio Convention. So um, this was all quite leading, world leading suggestions in some ways where we could have been ahead of the game, but we didn't quite catch up until fairly recently. We need to know about ecology, ecotypic plasticity, Zostra angustifolia versus Zostra marina. Are they the same thing or aren't they? Can one thing become the other if you move it somewhere else? Well, we might come back and think about that as well. Associated communities, what lives with the seagrass in Scotland? Didn't have any idea. Very few studies were beginning to fill those gaps. And I'll say a little bit about that later on as well. And then monitoring, what's going on over time? Did we have any time series? Well, no, not really. There is historical data, we'll come back to that. And that's the past bit, which we'll look at in a moment. But as I say, all of these things identified 30 years ago, but then sat there without really being acted on. This is another example of a bed in the fourth, just to show you that they do occur in sort of industrialised areas. This is near to Recife. This is on the North Shore in Fife, next to Lime Kilns, a place called Bruce Haven. Um, again, perhaps rather inauspicious looking, the sort of green veneer on the, uh, on the mudflat. Notice that it contrasts starkly with this bright green macroalgal mat over here of what used to be called Enteromorpha intestinalis, now ulva intestinalis. So it does contrast, and that comes back when we think about remote sensing and so on. There's, there's a potential for uh, monitoring in that way as well. OK, I'm going to bite the bullet and talk about Zostera marina and Zostera angustifolia um, straight off. And then we can get back into thinking about the larger scale things to do with seagrass in a moment. These are herbarium specimens again, so I've been relying quite heavily on the RBG herbarium here. Um, subtidal marina, we can see this typical sort of growth form, which we would term a decumbent stem, sort of like a hockey stick bend in the base of the stem almost. And these large, long leaves, usually about a centimetre or so wide, we can see that very clearly here in a slightly fresher specimen. And again, you see this sort of curve at the base of the stem into the rhizoid and the and the root system. Zostra angustifolia, relatively small, and we can see to some extent some similarities here. There's the Zostra marina here, Zostra angustifolia, more profuse branching, narrower leaves. Its common name is the narrow leaved eelgrass. Not very imaginative seagrass researchers in terms of naming things. Common eelgrass, narrow leaved eelgrass, dwarf eelgrass. So they kind of do what they say on the tin, more or less. Um, notice down here that the root system and the base of the stems looks somewhat different. Now, not all angustifolias are exactly like this. They do sometimes produce rhizomes and rhizoids and things as well. If it's an ecotype, we would imagine that if Zostra marina got into the intertidal, it should look like this. But we found specimens in Loch Ryan of marina growing in pools on the shore next to this stuff, where we see the typical root structure that we see in subtidal forms, which implies that it's not an absolute transition to a separate form if things are growing into tidally. So that begins to suggest maybe there's a little bit more to Zostra angustifolia than just a subtype of Zostra marina, but there is an ongoing argument and I'm happy to be pulled up on that if there's good evidence to the contrary, of course. Same environment, different growth forms. So this is the, oh, this is Zostra angustifolia blown up, and this is the Zostra marina, the intertidal specimen which we find. Okay, that's 
got that off my chest and I'm not going to say too much more about the taxonomy, but just to lay my cards on the table effectively. OK, past, present and future. That was what I said I was going to talk about. So where better to start than in the past? What are the oldest records of seagrass in Scotland? Cleta, very usefully in his report, had a gazetteer of all records that he could find from what was then the IT Institute of Terrestrial Ecology, paradoxically. I'm not quite sure what they were doing with seagrass, but there we go. I, the ITE Scare Species Programme, which incorporated seagrasses. And in their records, Dostra marina, probably the most prominent species and the one you're most likely to find, and it could potentially be washed up on beaches and so on. 1837 in Kakubri in uh, southwest in Galloway. Um, I'm Dumfries in Galloway, I suppose. Angustifolia, interestingly, although the taxonomy wasn't very clear until later in the 19th century, um, 1842, Tain Beach, so that's in the Highlands on the East Coast. Zostra Nultii, dwarf field grass, 1852, Hunterston, near where there's now the power station, and Fairley, both of which are in Ayrshire on the West Coast. So quite a sort of disparate range of places where these things were found, but no records really before that. Um, or very few. The oldest record in the herbarium here is 1814 from Norfolk, from Cly. Um, I haven't looked at Kew Gardens records and I haven't dug around in too much old literature, but there's not much going on before that. There are a few references to seagrass in anecdotal reports to do with other things. So, for example, there's a report of seagrass in Orkney being used as thatch for houses from stuff that was washed up on the beach, presumably. Um, it's not quite clear how much thatch was being used, whether this was for repairs or they had enough to thatch whole houses with it. That was again in the 1800s. There's another record of dried seagrass being used as packing for what was termed brittle wear, which we would just basically call crockery. So in effect, using it like straw to pack things which might otherwise get damaged in transit when you were putting them in boxes. So it was known about, but it basically wasn't recorded. Just a point to make here that these records, until fairly recently, potentially could have been misinterpreted. This is an addendum. You don't have to read all of this, but basically what it's saying is the species names Zostra Nolcii and Zostra Maria were transposed in the report, in the records at the end. So they got the species names the wrong way round on the headers of the pages, and that was corrected in 2013, 20 years after the report was actually released. So there could have been quite a lot of confusion about what was going on historically up to that point. So we've had that elucidated in the last 10 years. What that probably tells me is people weren't paying a lot of attention to seagrass nor to this report till that sort of time there. We started working on this about 2011. And we'll have to say I didn't notice that or I wasn't aware of that. So until more recently. So be careful to read all of that. That's the last page of the report. <laughs> so make sure you read all the way to the end, otherwise you might make some mistakes. RBGE, RBGE records in the herbarium here, in this building or one of these buildings at least, um, extend that record to some extent. So this is in praise of herbaria. Why it's important to have specimens kept for posterity, because you can go back and actually look at them and firstly see when and where they were from, hopefully, and also what they are and how they relate to present day taxonomy, which is equally important because often older taxonomies might have been confused, not fully worked out um, or have been inconsistent between workers at the time. Our oldest record here is from Aaron Brodick in 1815, we think, because if you're going to write the date on an herbarium specimen, please write it clearly. It's like detective work trying to do some of these, as you will see in a moment or two. It's very important to say where it's from and when it's from. Um, so the first thing you write on any specimen is the date and the place and, uh, that, and make it as clear and legible as possible, please, for the people in 100 years or 200 years time who might be looking at this. Um, we've got some near Stranra, 1835, Cromarty, 1827, so that's not far from Tain, I suppose. Um, Burghead, 1836, Montrose, 1840, North Uist, we think maybe 1841, but it's not very legible. Mull, sometime around then, but no date. Interestingly, many of these specimens in the herbarium are 
separate specimens which have dates on them which are several years apart. So it's unclear what's happened to those specimens when they've been mounted, whether they've been replaced from older uh, records and whether there's been any potential for transcription errors and this sort of thing. And there are a few where a place name has been, been scribbled out and something else has been put in its place, whether somebody's been working alongside an older note and made a mistake or whether somebody thought that was a mistake made and have corrected it, we're unsure. So it makes things a little bit um, entertaining, shall we say, to work out what's going on. Butte 1849, you can basically see the, the, the theme here is early 1800s is about as far back as we go for historical records that we can verify clearly. What's happening in the fourth, locally to here, the fourth dimension, as I like to call it. Uh, the oldest ones we have here, again, you can see this is a bit blurred because it doesn't blow up very well. There's the date. So we can just about see it's June the something, one, and then is it a seven? I'm not sure. June the 17th, maybe 1870, I think. Five, probably. It could be 1825, maybe, I don't know, but 18, probably 75, could be 1874 with a bit of a smudge on it. Um, so there's three different possible dates there. So as I say, please be clear. We know it's 18 because that's printed on the chit. Great, but uh, otherwise not so good. Likewise here, we've got, uh, this is Burnt Island. So you can see the writing's a bit of a challenge sometimes as well. That says Burnt Island, believe it or not. The Nook, wherever that is at Burnt Island. Um, and we think that says 1833, maybe. Um, that might be a bit optimistic. There's, there's Ostra Marina from, there we are, scribbled out somewhere. I think that says Burnt Island underneath, and then it says Abilady, which is the opposite side of the fourth. So not sure, but that looks pretty convincingly 1835, which is not too far away from that. So again, 1830s and so on within the fourth. So we think that we do have a good one actually for 1825. That is a bit blurry, I'm afraid, blown up, but that's 1825, I'm pretty sure, and that's Burnt Island, well, near Burnt Island. Um, so we're getting back to the 1820s. So we're coming up for 200 years of verified records of seagrass in the fourth. We'll see that that's important a little bit later on. Notice, what does that look like to you, given your new combined taxonomic expertise with seagrass? And Gustafolia, yeah, all day long, I think, yes. So, And Burnt Island would make sense on the shore, and it is the biggest bed of Angustifolia, which we have in the fourth to this day, interestingly. OK, so historically, 1825, we're going to go back to, to 1900. What was happening in the 1900s? We have records from these places here. There's Burnt Island. There's, believe it or not, Black Rocks at least. Black rocks at least still uh, exist, but most of them are under concrete. There's a little bit sticking out past leaf docks, but they got built on, which is a common feature along this bit of coast. There are various records of things there which can't be there anymore because they're underneath land claim. We've got a record here at uh, Abilady Kilspindy. We'll come back to that. Um, we've got one here at Gullen, which is probably drift on the beach. But again, many of these records don't tell you whether they were picked or whether they just washed up somewhere. Um, and then we've got Tinningham here, which again, there are still seagrass beds there now. 20th century, we get an increase in records. The open circles are ones where we used to have records in the 19th century and we don't have them subsequently. So Gullen, I'm not too surprised about because I think probably, as I say, that was drift, which has probably come from here somewhere. Still got Dunbar, still got Abilady. We've got Gosford Bay, Ferny Ness, that sort of direction. Crampton has gone because it's now subsumed in black rocks. We've got Crammond. We've got things going on in the estuary above the bridges where it's very muddy and probably people weren't going on Sunday outings in the 19th century. And we've got Burnt Island again. So effectively similar sorts of places with the addition of places up here in the somewhat industrialised estuary. And then into the 21st century. And what do we find? Well, we've started looking more. So this is not necessarily an indication that we've, seagrass has been expanding and increasing over time. We have additional sites here, Dunbar, very, very small site there. Um, Tinningham's still there. We've got a site, again, very confined on open rocky shore at school. Um, Abilady, Gosford, Cramond, and then more turning up in the estuary, and we've still got Burnt Island. So effectively, we're getting an incremental increase in knowledge of where seagrass is. 
I would say we can't be confident that this is some sort of expansion. So sometimes people look at this and say, oh, that's great. We've got a time series showing seagrasses increasing. And you've just said it was decreasing at 7% per year, potentially globally. The first and fourth is a winner. We've got more seagrass than we had before. Probably not, um, because we need to look carefully at the records. And that's what we got a student, Sam Freeman, to do a few years ago. This was during lockdown. So it was an ideal project for lockdown. Look at all the historical data and collate it all. Laborious master's student work, which he did very well. Um, the rating's a bit small here, I'm afraid, but the important bit is the dashes and the fact that along the bottom, we've got all of these sites in the fourth. So we've got Abadar, Abelady, Black Rocks and so on. The shaded ones are the ones in the estuary, which is above the fourth bridges. And then the other ones are in the outer first or fourth, where it's potentially more marine or at least it's more open. And importantly, possibly less prone to pollution and industrialization and that sort of thing. And what's he done here? Basically, what he's done is plot a dash in any year where there was a record at that site for the black ones are Zostra noltii, dwarf field grass, the very small one. And the blue ones are Zostra angustifolia, so intertidal, larger, narrow leaved eelgrass. Uh, and there is one record in the force, which is a red dot of good Zostra marina, which is from an herbarium specimen here at RBGE. So assuming that the location is correct, that was from Abadara. That's the only seagrass record we have from there, interestingly. And it's the only verifiable record of subtitled Zostra marina that we've actually got from the force, intriguingly. Um, so uh, maybe it was here in the past and perhaps it got wiped out by increased turbidity, industrial pollution and all that kind of stuff. OK, what does this tell us? It tells us that we've been recording better from about 1950 onwards. It also tells us that some sites, Burnt Island, has a pretty consistent record with a big gap in the middle of the 20th century of re records of seagrass. And the parsimonious explanation of that would be that it's probably been there all the time and we just haven't looked. It's possible that we have been lucky enough to just go there when the seagrass was there and find it, and in between times it had disappeared. But probably it's been there all the time, and we'll come back and see some recent evidence to support that. So the bottom line is that it looks as though we've had a reasonable record of fairly long-term persistence over the last 100 to 200 years of seagrass in the fourth. So there is a positive story. It's not that it's been increasing a lot, because I think we've just been looking more recently, and so that's why we found more. But it has apparently been stable right through the 20th century when there was an awful lot of industrial pollution going on in the fourth and sewage pollution and all sorts of horrible stuff. So it's quite resilient. So maybe as an indicator of water quality in terms of contamination, maybe seagrass isn't quite as good as we might have imagined it would be. But in a sense, that's a good thing because it means it is resilient and it's actually surviving some of these things. This is just the uh, upshot of all of this. How good a feeling do we have for persistence of seagrass over the longer term in these sites? And we can see the green ones. We've got several sites where we've got good evidence for long term persistence of seagrass. Yellow is sort of fairly good, but there might be long gaps. And then the grey ones are sort of not really very good at all. There's only just sporadic records. So that's the fourth. What about Scottish seagrass more generally? Similar sort of picture in the sense that the more we look, the more we find. And we've got areas where we haven't really looked, so we might be a little bit uncertain about what's going on. But we do have some areas of concern. So this is where we've been looking here so far. Green stuff is intertidal. I haven't distinguished here between Nolte and Angustifolia. It's just intertidal seagrass. So we've got quite solid information on the East Coast, including the River Eden estuary at St Andrews, the Tay uh, and Tayport particularly, Montrose Basin, very, very important area. Um, we've got Inner Murray Firth, Bewley Firth, Cromarty Firth, Dornoch, Loch Fleet and so on up here, all intertidal seagrass areas of some importance. Very little, if anything, going on in terms of subtidal seagrass. There's a question mark there. There are records in Colburn and around Nairn of subtidal seagrass, which I suspect are good. Uh, and we could go and have a look there, but we haven't got verified records recently. Um, Orkney, quite important. And we've got subtidal seagrass up there. Shetland, subtidal seagrass. They look quite important, as you might expect, relatively clean water and so on. But of course, there are ongoing worries about fish farming and, agri uh, and, and fishing and this sort of thing. West Coast, lots of subtidal seagrass, as you would anticipate, because you've got clear water, oceanic water. 
um, and lots and lots of relatively shallow sandbanks and so on, particularly in the Outer Isles, but in some of these in you know, Ebridean areas as well. But we've got some red crosses in here. What are those? Those are areas where historically there were records of seagrass, particularly intertidal seagrass, where it is not present any longer, as far as we can see. So there have been losses, mainly of intertidal seagrass, and in some cases of subtidal seagrass as well on the west coast. We're not aware of this on the east coast to the same extent. That seems odd to me anyway, because you imagine east coast, more population, more industrialization and so on. Therefore, that should be a bit of a bad place for seagrass. But the losses are in places on the west coast, which we wouldn't think of as being particularly unpleasant in terms of water quality. So, you know, Loch Linney, Loch Creeran, Arran, um, and I think that is somewhere on it's either Sky or Noida. No, it's not Sky. Sky up there, but uh, in in somewhere in the west, north of Malm, Ardnamurchan, or somewhere like that. So there's something slightly odd going on there, which we don't understand. But nevertheless, we've got quite a lot of healthy seagrass populations on the west coast. So it's an important place for seagrass. And the important areas we can highlight um, for subtidal Zostra Marina, Western Isles particularly, Sound of Harris. It's been estimated maybe up to 1,500 hectares. Nobody's measured it properly yet. But we've certainly done surveys up there and there is a lot of it. If you've ever been on the ferry from Burnery, just north of North Uist, across to Leverborough uh, in uh, South Harris. Anybody been on that ferry? Very, very shallow ferry route. It's, but it gets disrupted very much for low tides quite often um, because it just the boat can't get through. It's too shallow, covered in seagrass. Absolutely. You, you will have sailed across a seagrass bed. You can probably see it from the boat on a sunny day, to be honest. Um, so. There's my recommendation for seagrass spotting if you can't get in the water. Um, Sound of Barra, likewise, so that's indicated there. Orkney, a lot of seagrass up there, and we've got people working up there with Harriet Watt, Joanne Porters, where one of our lecturers up there, uh, doing a lot of seagrass work up there. And we'll come back to that in relation to restoration in a moment. Nolte Eye, Montrose Basin is very important. Cromarty First has been suggested as the largest single seagrass, intertidal seagrass bed in Europe. Um, depending on how you de define the limits of a seagrass bed, but clearly very important. Um, Angustifolia, the Eden, has very large beds of this intertidal Angustifolia, intertidal marina. Probably Montrose Basin as well is relatively important, but most of that is Nolte Eye. So these are conservation hotspots, if you like, but you can see we've got a lot of other places we need to look as well. So we've got some questions arising from all of that. Are Scottish seagrasses stable or declining or increasing? And I suppose the answer to that is maybe. Um, why is the West Coast apparently worse for intertidal species? We really don't know. Can't see any good reason why things might have changed there. The immediate answer that a lot of people would say is, oh, fish farms, they must be having a bad effect. But they're not closely associated with the areas where the seagrass historically would have been in most cases. Um, What's the status of intertidal seagrass in the Hebrides? We don't really know that very well because people have just tended not to look. Maybe it's not there, but we don't really know for certain, um, with the exception of places like Skye, particularly in the inner Hebrides, of course. Um, if said Angustifolia is an ecotype, why is it not more prevalent in areas where there's lots of subtidal marina? Well, you might imagine it would get washed up and established and perhaps be important on the shore, but it appears that's not the case. We don't have very much in the way of intertidal seagrass on the west coast generally at all. We've got Zostra angustifolia down here um, and uh, probably a little bit here, but most of this is Zostra nolthii that we see in these areas over here. So some interesting questions which we still haven't answered. We have research priorities still to go. OK, is Scottish seagrass declining? Let's try and answer one of those questions very briefly, and I'll try not to overrun too much. Um, we have a problem, and that is, problem is within bed dynamism. What do I mean by that? It means that the density and the occurrence of seagrass within a seagrass bed bounces around quite a lot from year to year, or even within years sometimes. So these are just some examples of places we've looked at and we've managed to build up time series which weren't previously available because the time series that Sam Freeman looked at were very gappy. So we can't really say very much about that. And most of them were only presence absence. They didn't have any indication of extent or density. So we've done GPS mapping here. This is in Carrigan Bay, Bowness in West Lothian or Falkirk. I'm never quite sure where it falls. Uh, 2011, black blobs are 
where the seagrass is. Now, this is not continuous cover, but there's no seagrass outside of this and the seagrass inside. So we're kind of taking a pragmatic view about extent. Uh, so there will be holes and gaps in here. This is two years later, another student. The bit of interest is this, because that's contiguous with that bit there. The seagrass over here, we didn't map at that point, which is this bit down here. But we can see superficially similar sort of shape, but in detail, it's somewhat different. We can see there are differences in the channel structure and whatnot, and the Zostra angustifolia is in those wet channels. We can see there. 2014 to 15, about a year, year and a half later, we came back and did the same thing again. And this is looking at uh, November. So that's about nowish, a bit earlier in the month. So it's beginning to die back a bit, is the clear pink stuff. And then in January of 2015, and the hatched bits. And what you can see is some things have even disappeared in that period because these seagrasses die back over the winter. So we were interested in seeing how fast those things die back. So we get changes within the season. But we also get quite clear changes year to year in terms of the shapes of the bed and what's going on. This is the just within year change at the bed at Brucehaven we looked at earlier, looking out over Resyth and the bridges and so on. So we get changes. We can see that even more readily if we start looking at, for example, satellite data. Sunny Kinghorn looking a bit like the Bahamas on this particular occasion in 2022. We have these seagrass beds, I will blow them up in a moment for you uh, at Burnt Island. We have 2018, 2020, sorry, 2018, 2020, and 2022. We were working in 2022. We had brown truth data, these dots in 2020, uh, sorry, 2018. 2020, we didn't have anything, of course, for the obvious reason that we had COVID and everybody was shut in. So we thought, wouldn't it be interesting to see what happened during that period when probably nobody was on the beach and there might not have been any disturbance? Did seagrass let rip? We can get a satellite image and have a look, but we need to be confident that what we get from the satellite image represents what's on the ground. So in order to convince ourselves of that, we took GPS points. We've got more of them to put in here, but I've only put some representative ones in the red dots to sort of say, well, the satellite imagery is the green outlines and the red dots are things that we know are seagrass on the ground. And the matchup is pretty good. We can do the same for these dots in 2018 when we also did some GPS work and we can see that the dots pretty much are falling within the satellite image. So we're fairly convinced that what we see on the satellite represents what's going on on the ground. What happened in 2020? Well, let's blow this up because that's a bit difficult to see. It's a bit blurry, I'm sorry. So there's 2018, as we saw. There's 2022 and there's 2020. Quite a big difference in the disposition of the bed in terms of where the seagrass is in outline. And it looks as though it's fragmented quite a bit, but it's also interestingly popped up over here, round at Burnt Island. We didn't have the map quite that far around, but you can see there's not anything in there. That is a bathing beach, blue flag bathing beach, which gets covered in people every time it's sunny because the railway station in Burnt Island is about here. So you can get on the train from Edinburgh and hop off the train and fall onto the beach and do whatever you do on the beach, which looks like disrupting seagrass activity because there's nothing much going on here, nothing much going on here, but it's having a great time on the beach when everybody's away. Um, but nevertheless, the rest of the bed's done something very weird. So the bottom line is that we can't say when seagrass is sustained through time that it's sitting there looking like a bowling green and not doing anything. There's an awful lot of change going on. But from what we already have said, we know there's been seagrass of this type, Angustifolia, here probably since 1825. So it hasn't gone away, but it's been doing a lot of stuff in between times every year. Why? We don't know. We need to find that out because that becomes important. Could it be that there are catastrophic events? Well, yes, that could be. There are, there's the seasonal dieback. So this is back to Bone S and Caridon. Here is, and these are slightly green tinged, so it's a bit of a cheap, but you can see, I hope, in these quadrats, quite dense coverage of Zostra multii in here. And this is an array of these quarter square meter quadrats, three by three to give a, a one and a half by one and a half meter quadrat. This is quadrat one and quadrat nine, just to give you a representative feel rather than showing you the whole lot in detail. But nevertheless, you can see there's quite a lot of seagrass in there, a little bit different, but nevertheless, you can see the seagrass in here. This is the same quadrat. So these are marked and positioned with GPS and canes in the ground and so on. We went back. This is two months later. And you can see there's just about see the seagrass in there, but it's died back quite a lot. So that's the seasonal variation. 
that you get the dieback of the of the nulti eye, particularly the leaves all drop off and get washed away and actually contribute to the detritus pool in the in the estuary. There is the same place three years later. There's been a channel washed right through it. That was where our quadrat was. I put that in to represent. That's not been there for three years. That's just to give a scale. But the quadrat was in the middle of here, which had seagrass like that in it. Um, and it's been washed out by a storm event and the movement of the channel, which has then cut the bed in two effectively. So that might be why we see this sort of thing going on. If there's been a storm event or a rainwater event or whatever it happens to be, which chunks the bed up potentially. There could be wave action. This is an example. This is Zostra multi-eye showing the rhizome exposed from the sand. You can see lots of ripples here implying there's quite a bit of wave action and it's got washed out of the up a couple of centimetres of sediment where it would normally be residing. And um, this is across at Blackness 2014. You might get macroalgal overgrowth. So here we've got ulva or intramorpha, if you prefer, um, intestinalis probably, although there might be a couple of other species in there. So lots and lots of filamentous green meat. And there struggling in the middle is some Zostra angustifolia, which you can imagine might get smothered uh, or shaded out or whatever. And that might result in, as you can imagine, a gap in the seagrass bed in the following year because things haven't been able to establish and grow. This was in the Eden estuary in 2013. There might be human impacts, things like boat moorings. This is at Blackness, so you can see a boat here with its twin keels. Look at these little ridges in the sediment where it's obviously swung around on the wind and landed on the seabed. This one has had a bit more of an effect. It's dug a trench and you can see in the foreground of this one, there's the seagrass just outside the radius of the boat mooring where otherwise it might otherwise be growing. You get some weird things. There's vehicle tracks across the mud flat at Boness. Don't know why. Seems a bit odd. Not sure you want to take your car down there at all, but never mind. Never mind. Somebody was out there, presumably. Even more weird at uh, Kinghorn Petticoat last year, baby buggy tracks. Somebody walked past us doing the survey with a baby buggy right across the middle of the mud flat out for a walk. And dog walkers probably doing similar sorts of things. So that can have an impact as well. Uh, bait digging. This is not from the fourth. I couldn't find a decent picture, but this is from South Africa. But nevertheless, if you're digging up worms and things from inside the seagrass bed, that's clearly going to have a bit of an impact as well. So there's a lot of dynamism going on. So we don't know necessarily whether things are increasing or decreasing or are more or less the same, but just a bit wobbly over time. Although probably that's my preferred option if I was to be asked. Abilady Bay, we've got some time series there. There has been, okay, I'll wrap up very soon. Um, 1991, there were surveys done, and this is showing you where the seagrass was. This is 2011, 20 years later, same bay, different bits of mud. Look at this one over here. It was in there then, it's moved a little bit then. Subsequently, there's 2014, similar sort of picture to here, as you might expect. But look, we've got some dots on the other bank now, which weren't there before. Nothing on that side at all. Now look, hot off the press, this is from a month ago. We've got a huge patch of seagrass on that side of the river now. Never recorded there before, according to the uh, Nature Reserve Warden at Abilady. Um, but it's increased quite substantially. So we've got almost twice as much seagrass in there now as we had in any previous year recorded in the last 30 years. So it looks as though it's increasing at Abilady, although the locals are all worried that it's disappearing because of stormwater overflows and macroalgal blooms and things. And we're going to have to go and say, uh, actually, it's looking all right. So it is going up in places. So probably it's going up and down. Difficult to tell what's going on. Many beds are dynamic, short term increases, short term decreases, probably dynamically stable, I would like to say. But we need to meet uh, the data needs to find out what's going on. How about the future? Very rapidly. Is there a decline? It's not really clear. I think we can be quite hopeful in many ways that it's survived a whole lot of traumas in the past and is still here. And there is evidence in places that it's actually increasing or at least maintaining itself. Hooray, good. But that's not a reason to be complacent. What effect will climate change have? Don't know. Could be more freshwater runoff. So it could fragment the beds more and get these catastrophic events. There might be more storms, more wave action. That might not be good either. You could get coastal squeeze, seagrass being forced up the beach and then coming up against hard engineering, which it can't survive. 
with deepening sea levels and potentially higher turbidity. So it might be bad, one might uh, surmise. Pollution, we're not sure, we don't know. It might not be as bad as we think for seagrass, it might be more resilient than we give it credit for. Nature-based solutions, well, that's the coastal protection bit. NBS is short for nature-based solutions. That's what engineers like. Oh, we can defend the whole coast by putting in seagrass. I'd love the engineers to plant seagrass everywhere, but I'm not sure it would do the job they think it's going to do because it's not like a hard concrete wall. Um, so yes, encourage them to do it, but no, it's probably not going to allow you to build lots of expensive houses right on the beach. Should we try to restore and reinforce these populations? Well, I'm part of Restoration Force, a project alongside Project Seagrass, World Wildlife Fund, and so on, looking at whether we can restore and reinforce these populations. And this is some examples from this year, again, hot off the press. This is transplanted Zostra marina at Drum Sands, growing in, I think, about June or July time, having been planted in March. It looks quite healthy and it's doing well. Interestingly, that subtitle marina, having been planted out in the fourth, although you can see it's pretty wet where it is. This is Zostra nultii, which was transplanted. And again, it looks as though it's doing well. So the potential is there to assist and support those populations and potentially re-establish them in places where we know there were historical records, but there now aren't any seagrass, such as those places on the West Coast, for example. There's the process. Esther Thompson of Project Seagrass collecting seeds in Orkney. They get stuffed in sacks or the whole spades, the, the, the shoots with the seeds on, get put in sacks to store them and they're then transported down to Kinghorn and North Berwick, although the North Berwick facility got a bit of a beating in Storm Babette, unfortunately. Um, but nevertheless, we store them there over the winter and then they're ready to plant out using glue guns to put them into the surface layers of the sediment. Carbon storage. The in short answer to this is, Maybe it's not as good at storing carriages with the carbon as we think it is. Some are, like Posidonia, there's a Posidonia bed in the Mediterranean. There's its root system, meters thick, lots and lots of carbon in there, not doing anything. It's like a tree trunk, effectively. So you've got carbon stored in there. Our Zostra doesn't do that. It's got a very shallow root system. So there are roots there, but it's nothing like as efficient at carbon capture. So we can't make a broad brush statement about carbon storage in seagrass generically when it's across these three different families, very different growth forms and so on. Um, it may be that persistence is the key. So some of these plants like Posidonia are extremely persistent in the environment over long time periods. Where are our zosteras? Down this end, where they tend to be a little bit more dynamic and bouncing about and, uh, and somewhat ephemeral, you might say. Biodiversity, finally. Limited work on UK beds, but we've got recent work on invertebrates showing that indeed seagrass beds do seem to support more animals, invertebrates of one sort or another, mollusks and annelids, worms, and crucially, more species compared to unvegetated adjacent sediment. They're also important for things like, if you're interested in birds, widgeon, which eat seagrass, and brent geese, not so much in the fourth, but certainly in places like Norfolk and so on. Can we have carbon storage and biodiversity at the same time? My short answer to that would be no, not really. If you're going to store carbon, you're preventing it being used for apotrophic levels as food. So if you're storing it, you can't have many organisms up the food chain. So you can have a low diversity system. If you want biodiversity, you need to release that carbon as food and allow it to get into the ecosystem, in which case you can have lots of species, but they're going to respire all that carbon. And what do you do when you respire? You give out CO2. So it's going back into the atmosphere as CO2 again. So it's not a get out of jail card having seagrass beds. That's not to say I don't want seagrass beds. I definitely do, but don't get them for the wrong reason. So finally, to your relief, no doubt. Three species of seagrass in Scotland. I hope I've made a little bit of a case for Zostra angustifolia, at least to be something special, if not a species. Two intertidal species are the predominant on the west, east coast, rather. Subtidal species are much more on the west coast and northern isles. East coast intertidal populations, such as the fourth, where we've done most work, seem to be semi-stable, although they are very volatile, which makes it a challenge for things like monitoring and using them for things like the Water Framework Directive. When do you intervene? If there's a massive change in the seagrass, is it a problem or is it just an interannual variation which we would see potentially naturally? We haven't got long enough time series to really make a confident answer to that. West Coast populations, we have less historical information, obviously. We're very lucky in Edinburgh and the fourth, having the RBGE, we've got a really good historical record of, of what's going on here, comparatively. Not as good as we might like, but nevertheless, it's pretty reasonable. 
intertidal seem to be declining on the west coast and we don't understand why it should be would, would have thought a nice place for them albeit we don't have the big muddy estuaries that we have on the east coast subtidal looks fairly stable but of course there are pressures and problems with uh, seabed disturbance shipping boating fishing and various things which might cause problems what are the future risks climate change coastal squeeze coastal developments and can restoration work well yes it looks as though it can but the jury remains out as to whether we should be doing it and whether we need to do it so we need to prioritize where we target that i think and i will leave it at that for now thank you very much for your attention